Welcome to another stock investment analysis video. In June, I created a video analyzing energy transfer. In that video, I provided an in-depth look at energy transfer, the energy industry, and midstream energy companies in particular. If you have not seen that video before, I highly recommend you watch it first because today's video will be giving an update to it. You will need that foundation before you see today's video. Since my last video, I have been receiving a lot of questions about my thoughts on energy transfer, whether my opinion has changed, whether I believe the dividend or distribution will be cut, and whether I will continue to buy. Today's video will answer all of those questions and give you a careful look at recent events for energy transfer, what it means for energy transfer as an investment, and how I see the future for energy transfer. We will discuss issues related to the global health and economic crisis, the upcoming U.S. presidential election, OPEC, the Dakota Pipeline, and the future of energy. If you liked today's video, please hit the like button to get this video out to more people who are interested. Also, feel free to subscribe to ensure you always get notifications for future videos. Before I get into energy transfer, I would first like to announce the winner of last week's Div Tracker. Our winner is Carlos Leva. So Carlos, please contact me and I will get the information you need to receive your free $99 Div Tracker subscription and thank you to everyone for watching and participating. Now on to energy transfer. The major reason some investors are concerned and some are very interested in energy transfer at the share price is the share price has taken a massive beating, giving us an extremely low valuation and a very high distribution yield. Technically, energy transfer pays a distribution rather than a dividend, but for the sake of this video, we are going to consider them as the same. Year to date, the share price is down 55% and at the time I made this video, the distribution was a ridiculously high 20.27%. In terms of valuation, the price to earnings is 11.8, the price to sales is 0.35, and the price to book is 0.79. So the big question is, with such a massive distribution yield and such low price and valuation, are we looking at an incredible investment opportunity or is this a huge value trap? I will do my best to answer that question here. Remember, I am not a financial advisor and this is only my personal opinion. First, let's remember it is not only energy transfer which has taken a beating this year. The entire industry has fallen by over 37% and its competitors have also taken a big hit to share price. The loss of share price is not specific to energy transfer. If you are unsure of why energy has been hit so hard, the biggest reason is the most obvious, which is the economic and health crisis hitting our planet at this time. Travel and many other industries have been disrupted resulting in weak demand for energy. This of course hurts the energy sector. You can see from this chart from the U.S. Energy Information Association, total world consumption for petroleum and other liquids, for example, fell from 101.46 million barrels per day in 2019 to 92.84 million per day in 2020. That's a sizable drop. This and other areas of weakness in the sector have of course hurt energy transfer. Now please also note that 2021 is projected to be back up 99.09 in terms of consumption. Production will actually likely be less than consumption, up at 98.83. What else hurt energy transfer this year? A disagreement related to OPEC or the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. A Russia and Saudi Arabian oil price war in March of 2020. Saudi Arabia reportedly started a price war with Russia for oil which resulted in a 65% drop in oil prices. Around that time, US oil prices fell by 34%, crude oil fell by 26%, and Brent oil fell by 24%. Russia had walked out of an agreement over proposed oil production cuts during the global pandemic following a 30% drop in oil prices. However, in April and later in June, OPEC reached new agreements for oil production cuts which helped stabilize oil prices to some extent. OPEC has just in the past week announced their continued dedication to keeping oil prices stable as their primary goal. They acknowledge oil demand is growing slower than initially expected, but are still expecting a rebound in 2021 and are very confident in growth following what they see as an inevitable vaccine in 2021. In other words, the issues with the global recession, reduced oil consumption, and the oil price war are temporary. When they rebound, I see a rebound for energy transfer as well. We only need to first pass through the storm. Another concern for some investors, and which has put some pressure on energy share prices, is the US presidential election. If Trump wins, we can expect things to continue in a relatively similar manner to the past four years in terms of energy. Trump has lifted environmental restrictions and regulations on the energy sector and has strongly supported it. Whether you perceive this as a positive or negative may depend on a variety of economic, social, political, environmental, or even moral reasons. However, we are not focusing on those today beyond how it relates to investing as this is our video topic. If Trump remains in office, it will of course benefit energy transfer. What if Biden wins? In a town hall meeting last week, Biden announced, the future rests in renewable energy. 
This should not come as a surprise to anyone who's been following U.S. politics. If the Democrats take the White House and the House of Representatives and or the Senate, we should expect to see a greater focus on renewable energy and additional restrictions on energy companies. Biden's plan calls for ending new oil and gas leasing on public lands. Despite the concern this may give energy transfer investors, I am not as worried. Although I believe a Biden win will certainly reduce energy production, increase energy costs, and therefore reduce profitability. It will also make creating new pipelines and infrastructure very difficult. Building pipelines used to transport energy, whether it be oil or natural gas, will become far more expensive as restrictions and requirements increase. Getting permits and going through the legal paperwork will become far more challenging. As a quick example of how challenging it already is during the Trump administration to get approval and build a pipeline, for the Dakota Access Pipeline, Energy Transfer had to get more than 1,000 certificates, permits, and approvals, held 559 meetings with various groups, participated in 43 various public meetings and open houses, and underwent 140 route deviations and 17 route adjustments. This will become far more challenging with the Biden administration. Does this benefit solar and wind farms? Certainly, but it also helps companies like Energy Transfer, which already have a massive network of pipelines. The new restrictions could kill any efforts for competitors to compete with Energy Transfer. It could also make it so that Energy Transfer has to focus more on paying down debt and less on acquiring new companies or pipelines. This could actually benefit Energy Transfer despite the many negatives for the sector. Further, even if Biden wins and promotes renewables, the U.S. cannot shut down oil and natural gas and survive. The U.S. and the world relies heavily on these energy sources to function. Take a look at this chart created by the U.S. government through the U.S. Energy Information Administration. If you look at renewable energy between 1990 and 2040, you see a huge surge. This is what Biden wants and honestly what I suspect most of the world wants. However, also take a look at natural gas in blue. It is growing just as fast during this time period. Look at petroleum and other liquids. It is not growing as fast, but it is still expected to be growing by the end of 2040, 20 years from now. In other words, while renewables will absolutely continue to grow and present investment opportunities, the world's energy needs are growing far faster than renewables can provide. The world population is exploding, as is economic development in many countries which previously had very low energy needs. The U.S. Energy Information Administration also provides statistics for the U.S. specifically. Again, renewables are expected to grow through 2040, but so is natural gas and petroleum isn't going anywhere. In conclusion here, yes, there is a push for renewables, but no energy transfer will not be obsolete in the next few decades and it remains a good investment. Now you can see that the share price of energy transfer recovered quickly between the low in March and June. However, since that time it has declined once more. That has nothing to do with OPEC and less to do with the global recession as that was generally priced in back in May and June as well. So what happened? The answer is the Dakota Pipeline. As a quick history lesson, the Dakota Access Pipeline, or DAPL, is a 1,172-mile-long pipeline which extends through the U.S. states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois. The pipeline cost almost $4 billion. This pipeline is partially owned by Phillips 66, Enbridge, and Marathon Petroleum, but Energy Transfer are the controlling majority owners. It was completed in 2017 and has been transporting oil ever since. Seems simple enough, right? There is a long political, cultural, and environmental battle surrounding this pipeline. I will not make any opinions as to which sides are right or wrong, and I cannot definitively say I truly know the motivations of any of the sides. However, a number of Native American tribes, particularly some of the Sioux tribal nations in North Dakota, protested the pipeline. Some of the concerns by the tribes and other concerned individuals were related to the environmental impact as well as potential damage to historic and cultural sites. Energy transfer in response stated environmental impact studies had shown that it was safe and that multiple archaeological studies conducted with state historical preservation offices found no sacred items along the route. Advocates for each side have accused the other side of greed and attacking the other side for monetary reasons. I will save you the extensive details, but the summary is that, despite all those controversies, the pipeline was ultimately approved, completed, and it began to operate. In March of 2020, a United States district judge ruled that the government had not studied the pipeline's effects on the quality of the human environment enough, ordering the United States Army Corps of Engineers to conduct a new environmental impact review. This also contributed to the share price plunge in March. However, many investors and analysts did not take it seriously and the share price rebounded. However, in July of 2020, a district court judge issued a ruling for the pipeline to be shut down and emptied of oil pending a new environmental review. Many investors panicked and sold. The temporary shutdown order has since been overturned by U.S. Appeals Court on August 5th, though the environmental review is expected to continue. 
This explains the decline in share price over the last several months. So what happens next? Well, based on my review of many analyses by political, legal, environmental, and financial experts more knowledgeable than myself on this subject, I believe the environmental impact statement will most likely not find any environmental concerns. I expect the pipeline to remain open and energy transfer will continue to benefit. So why don't I think it'll be a problem? While no one can predict the future with 100% accuracy, I'll give you a few reasons I believe the pipeline will not be permanently closed. First, on July 26, 2016, the Army Corps of Engineers approved the federal easements for the pipeline and stated that there will be no significant impact on the environment. In October 9, 2019, the Army Corps filed a motion in which it claimed the Corps undertook a comprehensive analysis of the three limited items and remanded for additional consideration, and asked the Corps to reaffirm its dismissal of Standing Rock's claims. It is now that very same Army Corps of Engineers who is deciding whether there is a negative impact. Given their prior statements, I expect them to stand by their own prior decisions and assessments. Few people or agencies want to be sued and then admit they were wrong. The Army Corps of Engineers is no different. It is of course also possible that they were never wrong in the first place. Furthermore, pipelines are safer now than in past decades and the Dakota Access Pipeline is quite new. This means the odds of environmental issues are lessened. It is also important to note that the area of dispute for the Dakota Access Pipeline is only in one specific area, primarily under a lake. However, the Dakota Access Pipeline is the eighth pipeline to be built there and it is by far the deepest. If the other seven have been allowed to operate there, why not the Dakota Pipeline? How could a newer and deeper pipeline have a greater environmental impact than the other seven which have been allowed to operate without issue? My guess is the answer is politics and money. Based on this information and the expectations by experts that it will not be shut down, I expect it to remain open. A DC federal court has already indicated that it will not rule until late December, which means the pipeline will not be shut down at least until then. By the beginning of 2021, very shortly after that, energy transfer is expected to be free cash flow positive given many of their projects which have been coming online in 2020 and early 2021, which makes me even more confident in their ability going forward regardless of the Dakota decision. Even if they receive bad news, please remember that the Dakota Access Pipeline is not 100% of energy transfer's pipelines. In fact, it's not even close. Here is a map of their pipelines. Dakota is only the single pipeline here. It is also interesting that on October 15th, news broke that Illinois regulators have approved an expansion of the Dakota Access Oil Pipeline. The Illinois Commerce Commission said that additional pumping stations and equipment needed for the pipeline's capacity to be nearly doubled to 1.1 million barrels per day are necessary. Now for the big question, is the distribution going to be cut? Ultimately, I do not believe so. Let me explain why. The Mariner East expansion represents one of Energy Transfer's last remaining large growth projects after the Lone Star Express pipeline expansion entered service last month. This means Energy Transfer is close to reaping the rewards of their expensive investments. Further, they intend to reduce capital investment through 2023, which will boost free cash flow for the next three years. In fact, as you can see here, they expect to reduce growth capital by 15% in 2020 and by 28% just in 2021 alone. The company's network of pipelines, which touches nine of the top 10 US oil and gas producing basins, attracts supply and demand side customers who want access to cheap gas, oil, and other refined products. Its high share of fee-based contracts make cash flow more stable than other energy companies. As a result, I expect continued stable and eventually growing free cash flow as debt and costs reduce. This could allow for paying debt more quickly, repurchasing units which would be a great idea given the distribution yield, or even growing the distribution in the future. Morningstar, for example, expects their future cash flows could grow their distribution at 6% per year. For anyone who bought in at a 20% yield, a 6% annual growth in the future would be insane. So what if they cut the dividend? Will I sell? The answer is no. I'm in it for the long haul and I believe the valuation is outstanding even with a dividend cut. First, even if they cut the dividend by 50%, I'm still getting an amazing 10% yield which is sky high. If they did cut the distribution, the additional money they would have could be used to pay down debt or buy back shares which would significantly improve energy transfer's fundamentals and over time result in an increase in share price, still returning money to my pocket. Okay, let me show you a few more things for our updated analysis. Even with that huge loss of share price more than 50% over the past year, since it went public, it still has almost exactly the same total annual returns as the S&P 500 given its massive dividend. In fact, if the share price remains flat for the next five years and they maintain their distribution, I can almost guarantee it will beat the S&P 500 in the future for returns because the S&P 500 is unlikely to return 20% annually like that distribution yield will. Also note that despite a huge yield and past financial problems, 
energy transfer has never cut their distribution in the past. You can see that the compound annual growth rate is 24% for the distribution, but this is misleading given that there was a 500% increase in 2007, which makes the average seem higher than it typically is. If we cut out the first two years to remove that 500%, the compound annual growth rate since 2008 has been almost 9%, which is encouraging. If the share price returns to the five-year normal PE of 15.6, according to Fastgrass forecasting calculator, we should expect a 57% annual return until the end of 2023. That would give us a $22.31 share price. If we wanted to be more conservative and use the two-year normal PE of 12.82, we would still see a 49% annual return given the currently very low blended PE of 9.42 and the expected growth of earnings of 145%, 11%, and 16%. That would give us an $18.34 share price. Next, look at their free cash flow. They have never been free cash flow positive, relying instead on a model of debt. As you can see, their free cash flow has been growing rapidly, growing at 31%, 16%, 103%, 606%, 0%, and then projected to grow 88% next year. At that point, it will finally cover the distribution for the first time. To me, that is huge, and I'm encouraged by that. For what it's worth, Morningstar analysts see fair value at $20 compared to today's share price of $6.02. That $20 share price estimate is right between the $18.34 and $22.31 share prices we just saw in fast graphs. That $20 is an insane 70% discount. In fact, they see anything under $14 per share as a great buy. Thinbox gives us a summary of 18 different analyst targets. They range between $6 per share and $20 per share. The median price target is $10.33. Given the current share price is at $6.02, these 18 different analyst sources see almost universal upside, which is rare. Thinbox provides us with a five-year discounted cash flow EBITDA exit. Remember from my prior videos that EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. I like to use EBITDA for capital expenditure heavy companies like energy transfer. They see a 235.8% upside based on a fair value of $21.31 with a fair value range of $17.63 up to $25.31. This is very similar to the numbers that we saw with Morningstar and Fastgraphs. Ford Equity Research, despite having a hold rating, notes that the operating earnings yield for the relative valuation is at 15.9%, which is above 97% of the companies they cover. Let's look at one final model provided by Refinitiv for energy transfer. We are looking at share price and earnings per share estimates. The share price target versus the current share price is 59%. In other words, they believe the share price should be 59% higher within 12 months. Although the current share price is $6, they see the lowest being at $6, the high being at $15, and the mean at $10 per share based on the work of 19 analysts. This means that at worst, 12 months from now, we would have the same share price and would collect 20% distributions. At best, we would also see that 20% distributions plus see our share price more than double from $6 to $15. A likely expectation based on the numbers is a 20% yield plus 59% in share price growth to $10. If you're curious about why the Refinitiv and the analyst estimates are lower than what we saw for Thinbox and for Fastgraphs, remember that Thinbox and Fastgraphs estimates were looking several years in the future, whereas these are looking at the next 12 months. We would therefore expect to see smaller share price estimates for the next 12 months than we would expect to see in three or even five years. In summary, I see a massive opportunity for distributions or dividends and a great opportunity given the valuation for future share price appreciation. I have continued to buy energy transfer and I plan to continue to do so. What are your thoughts on energy transfer as an investment? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. I'm excited to see what you think. Take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell because I'm creating new videos for you. As always, good luck with your investing.